Welcome to the August 30th meeting of the Rotary Club of Louisville. I'm Luke Schmidt, president elect of our club and president of LB Schmidt and Associates. To lead us in our invocation today is Teresa Leeser. Teresa is the CEO at NeuroCares. O oh, creator and sustainer of all that is or will ever be, accept our thanks this day and all its blessings. We turn to you this Labor Day weekend to bring the work of our minds and hands to the touchstone of your high standards as we pay tribute to the contributions workers have made to the strength, prosperity, and well-being of our country. As the master craftsman, your exquisite detail and soaring splendors leave us in awe as we vainly strive to emulate. When we think of the work of your hands, like the beauty of a butterfly wing or a moonlit sea, we can only be amazed. We thank you that we can work and serve, and while doing so, pray that you will inspire us with your passion for excellence, so that while we build, we may beautify, while we serve, we may heal, and while we work, we may worship. Amen. Thank you, Teresa. Tony Kemper will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance in our four-way test. Tony is the head of the DePaul School and the immediate past president and a Paul Harris Fellow. Tony. Thank you, President-elect Luke. Please join me in pledging our allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now please join in the four-way test, the four-way test which drives how we think, what we say, and what we choose to do. Together, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Earlier this week, the Louisville community lost a true ambassador and the Rotary Club of Louisville lost a true friend. We join the community in mourning the passing of John Asher, longtime Vice President of Racing Communications at Churchill Downs. John was a fixture at Rotary meetings every year during Derby Week. None of us will ever forget the passion and exuberance that John would bring to us in sharing his insights into the horses, riders, and trainers, all leading up to the big race. John did everything but guarantee each of us the winning ticket. Prior to joining Churchill Downs, John enjoyed a career in broadcasting with stints at both WAVE AM and WHAS AM. <clears throat> Perhaps more importantly, John was a servant leader and was a board member at several nonprofit organizations. The Rotary Club of Louisville extends our sincere condolences to John's family and also to the Churchill Downs family. <clears throat> now is the time to welcome guests to our meetings. Rotarians, if you would approach the microphone Introduce yourself first and then acknowledge your guest. We'd appreciate it. Ladies first. <laughs> President elect Tony, I am so pleased to introduce Annabelle Pike. Annabelle is the Prevention Injury Manager with the Trauma Institute at University of Louisville Hospital, my friend and former colleague from Kentucky One. Great, welcome. President-elect Luke, I guess, is Tiffany Meredith with the Office of Communications and Marketing, Health Sciences Center, University of Louisville. Great. Rick King, my guest is Scott Lindbergh, a West Point graduate from 1993, and like normally, the Merchant Marine Academy is always leading the way for the West Pointers. Congratulations. Charlie. Hi, President Luke. Uh, Charlie Farnsley. My guest today is Kevin Borland. He's the co-owner of Malloy Borland PR. Great. Welcome. <laughs> President Luke, I have two guests from the DePaul School. Our admissions director is Aaron Wicker, and our chief development officer is Lisa Cobb. President-elect Luke, I'm Jim Remmers with Luckett & Farley, Architects and Engineers, and I have two of my colleagues with me, Rolf Proven, who's the Director of Marketing for the company, and uh, Brian Cutter, who is the Director of Marketing for Healthcare Facilities. Great. Welcome. They're very interested in the topic today, obviously. Uh -huh. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome. 
President-elect Luke, I'm Chris Whalen, and I'm very uh, happy to, to introduce two uh, uh, prospective members today, um, a, um, a dynamic young couple, uh, Nelson and Mary Jane Rhodes. Uh, Mary Jane is a uh, senior account director at Run Switch PR, and Nelson is a tax attorney with Frost, Brown, Todd, and we'd be, uh, we'd be very good to, uh, we'd, we'd do very well to add them to, uh, to Rotary. Great. Welcome. President-elect Luke, I'm Casey Mayer, and very proud to say that we have a new member of the staff at the Waterfront Botanical Gardens. I have right with me today Tyree Hughes, Manager of Finance and Operations. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to see all of the guests here today. And if any of the guests would like to learn more about Rotary and the service, fellowship, and philanthropy that all of us enjoy, We'd like to invite you to please see Craig Sherman for just a moment or two after the meeting at the What is Rotary table. Where is Craig today? Thank you, Craig. Please join Craig. He'll tell you a little bit more about the club. It's a very short briefing, but very informative. Now, in his final appearance as the announcer for the month of August, I'm really pleased to welcome Mike Cool back to the podium. Mike is a retired food service executive, past president of this club, past district governor, and also a Paul, Paul Harris Fellow and recipient of the District 6710 Rotarian of the Year Award for 2018. Mike. Thank you, Luke. Well, today our birthday list is the shortest of the month, but I did a little research, and these are people that have been with us for a number of years. The years of Rotary service of these five individuals totals 122 years in Rotary. So. Uh, John Walzak, Bill Rutledge, who has 43 years of Rotary membership, Chaz Lavelle, who has 35 years of Rotary membership, Stan Wetzel, and Amy Johnson. So let's give a happy birthday applause for them. <laughs> Time is close. I know everybody's been in training. Make plans to participate in the Subway Fresh Fit hike, bike, and paddle on September 3rd from 8 a.m. to noon at the Waterfront Park at the Great Lawn. Enjoy a morning full of fun with your family for the, this free, healthy community event. It is open to participants of all fitness levels, which makes us all eligible. Mentor training for the Rotary Promise Scholarship will be held on September 6th and 13th from 11.45 a.m. to noon at the Fraser Museum prior to the Rotary lunch meeting. Approximately 45 mentors will be needed this year for our work at Iroquois and Western High School, so please consider becoming a part of this. This is one of the most important programs we do during the year. To learn more about becoming a mentor or to review the mentoring schedule, please see the flyer on your table. And for questions, please contact Walt Kunau. The next thing we have after that for a social activity is invite a guest and enjoy a night of bourbon and braille. I just think that's a great title. I knew Greg Braun had to have something to do with this. With your fellow Rotarians on Tuesday, September 11th from 5.30 to 9.30 at the American Printing House for the Blind, the event is free. Note that the guests must be 21 years old, and registration is now open by using the link in Sparks or by logging on to DACDB. For more information, you can contact Greg Braun. The last honor flight of 2018 will happen on September 12th. It's coming back from Washington, D.C. The plane load of vets will be returning to Louisville International Airport about 9 to 9.30 on that evening. We hope some of our Rotarians and their families will come out to join in a very emotional welcome home. For more information, please contact Jerry Martin or Sophia Fisher. And next week's meeting will be here at the Fraser Museum and will feature Dr. Neely Bindupaduti. U of L president, sorry folks, no matter how many times I rehearsed it, it happened. The good news is I'm not in charge of the introductions next week. Thank you all very much. <coughs> Thank you, Mike. Now it's time for a couple of quick shout outs. First of all, our business energy gathering was held this past Tuesday night at the reopened Kentucky International Convention Center. It was a successful event with lots of Rotarians, guests, and prospective new members in attendance. 
want to say thanks to Alice Bridges and Jay Mallory for their hard work in setting up the event. And another big thank you goes to Michael Gabhart and Unified Technologies for sponsoring the event. <clears throat> At the August meeting, the board of the club officially approved these leaders for membership in the Rotary Club of Louisville. Please give them a warm welcome. I'd like to introduce them now. So new members and their sponsors, as I read your name, if you're in attendance, please stand so that we can recognize you. First new member is Jason Pierce. Jason is the Scout Executive CEO for the Lincoln Heritage Council, Boy Scouts of America. And Jason was sponsored by Carl Thomas and Kathy Knotts. Is Jason here today? Oh, okay. Uh, the next new member, Tim Hess. And Tim, if you're here, please stand. President and owner of the Growth Factory. Tim was sponsored by Lou Zacone and Alice Bridges. Kevin Fields. Is Kevin here today? Okay, President and CEO of the Louisville Central Community Centers, Incorporated, and Kevin was sponsored by Alice Bridges and also Barry Barker. All right, next new member, Harold Butler, the retired Chief Operating Officer of Stites and Harbison. Harold was sponsored by Robert Connolly and Charles Cronin. Is Harold here? Okay, we're gonna have to put the membership, or the attendance requirement back into place. <laughs> <laughs> and our last new member, Surely he's here. Craig Mooney is Craig here. All right. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we do this all the time, Craig, for new members, just, just like that. Okay. Craig is the Chief Financial Officer, Chief Operating Officer of the Bossy Construction Company, and Craig was sponsored by Barry Barker and also Steve Eggers. So again, Craig, welcome. Uh, and lastly, we have a young professional Rotarian member, Dr. Carl Kim, is, is Dr. Kim here? Okay, uh, Dr. Kim is a, a podiatric, I can't mispronounce that, surgeon with the University Foot and Ankle and the International Foot and Ankle Surgery Mission Trip Leader. And he was sponsored by Kevin Lynch and Alice Bridges. So welcome again to all of our new members. Now, here to introduce our guest speaker today is Gene West Lasavio. Gene is the owner, producer of Faces West Production, host of NPR's All Things Considered, and a director of this club. Jean, welcome. Thank you, the president. We have two speakers today. One, an erstwhile crackpot reporter for Wave TV, who would race to beat me on exclusive stories in 1987. Many of those stories had us standing in front of university hospitals, standing off with each other, trying to get a lead, where he would eventually become president and CEO of that very hospital between those bookends he has acquired more than 20 years of experience in executive leadership in hospitals. Our other speaker is a native of Greencastle, Indiana, but has spent the last 12 years at University Hospital where he completed his general surgical training and is now associate director of University Hospital's trauma division. He freely concedes that his life was largely uneventful until his marriage and the birth of his three children. Please welcome University Hospital President and CEO Ken Marshall and Associate Director of Trauma, Dr. Keith Miller. Thank you for the flashback, Gene. <laughs> if somebody has, um, you know, a, 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 a five or six hours, I can explain the, the path and progression of my professional career, but it, it's been quite a, quite a journey. Um, I'm Ken Marshall, I'm, I'm president and CEO at University of Louisville Hospital and the Brown Cancer Center, and you wanna introduce yourself, Keith? So I'm Keith Miller, I'm one of the trauma surgeons at University Hospital with the Department of Surgery. First of all, I wanna just say thank you for inviting us here. Um, we've, uh, we'll, we'll go into a pretty, uh, delicate subject and important subject in, in this community about um, violence and, and violence prevention. And I'll tell you how we start here. You know, uh, at University Hospital, we're obviously the teaching hospital, the, the teaching and, and research uh, arm uh, of the University of Louisville. Real high acuity patients, really sick patients. We're a level one trauma center. We have a comprehensive stroke center. Um, 
In our, our walls every day, hundreds of faculty, residents, medical students, nursing students. Um, it's a busy place. And uh, in, in addition to it being a busy place, for all, the, for all of those who join us, I, I tell them it's a hard place to work because we expect a lot and the patients are sick. Um, we've been uh, working in the past year of kind of moving away with um, the CHI, Catholic Health Initiatives, moving out of uh, Louisville, uh, bringing, it, bringing the University of Louisville Hospital closer to, to uh, the University of Louisville School of Medicine. Uh, and we've realized a couple of things. When you go through that work, there's a lot of uh, really hard stuff, but simple stuff to recognize. And so we've been going through that process for the last year. Um, but I think there's something more important that we've started to recognize this year because the first phase is over, is that if we really want to do what I'm here to do and, and what I know Keith is here to do, um, thinking in the past, which has been thinking about things that cross your threshold, um, doesn't work anymore. Uh, the important piece of, of what we do going forward is thinking about what happens outside our doors. That's a shift in the, the strategic direction of, of kind of how university hospital thinks about itself and how the School of Medicine uh, thinks about itself. And why is that important? Because I'll, I'll, um, you'll, you'll get an understanding of why that's important when we talk about violence prevention. Um, we're a level one trauma center. And uh, we are, as I often say, on the spear's tip of things that are very um, uh, important to this community and, and impact the social fabric of this community. And, and we get the first sign of that. Um, you can uh, look at the opioid crisis, which is a whole nother discussion, um, and how we have to deal with that uh, from a, um, a medical standpoint inside our four walls. We're going to talk about violence and the impact of that on the healthcare system today. But what we've realized is that if we just pay attention to what is happening inside our four walls, we're not doing a service to the patients who come to see us, and we're not doing a service to the community that we are here to serve. Um, and that's why we will start our discussion today and hope to have a discussion with you about the importance of looking at how these injuries uh, that are precipitated by violence start, and they start outside our four walls. Um, we will uh, introduce you to some, some programs that we've had in place for several, several years that are interven interventions around violence um, that look outside of our four walls. No longer can we be comfortable with saying we will treat what comes to us. We got to think about why something comes to us and how we can intervene beyond our four walls. Um, I'm going to um, stop there because I want Keith to go into the details of kind of how this affects our community, how this affects our health care system, and, and what we can do to, to impact and what we are doing to impact. Keith. So forgive my informality. Is it okay? Okay, forgive my informality. I get very nervous behind a podium, and so I do have to kind of creep out from behind there. Um, and I was asked to talk about firearm injury in Louisville, but we're really going to specifically focus on gun violence in particular. Firearm injury is a much broader topic, obviously. And uh, I was told we have 15 minutes to cover all of it, so uh, we'll get going. But uh, let's see. Oh, you have to turn this on uh, is the first step. You got to be very explicit with surgeons, all right? I mean, so what do we do first? We have to turn it on. Okay, so our first objectives, I, I want to talk about my and Marshall and U of L's stance on the Second Amendment. Got, no, this is not what we're going to talk about, okay? This is not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the scope of the problem. We're going to talk about national models, global models, really, and their implementation here in Louisville and some of the hospital's collaboratives, collaborative initiatives that are under, uh, are in evolution. I think this case is perfect because it illustrates a larger point. This is a young man who came into our hospital with a gunshot wound to the leg, all right? We evaluate him, 
He's not actively hemorrhaging to death. We're pretty happy with how he looks. He's complaining of chest pain. Well, that's a little odd with a gunshot wound to the, to the leg. We, during his workup, we found a, a bullet that was very close to his heart, eventually migrated into his heart. This is a phenomenon called a bullet embolus. It's relatively rare. We see it five times a year. Uh, it's rare enough that we write it up from time to time. But this, this taught me two things. Number one, bullets are unpredictable. How did they get there? It entered his femoral vein and went up his femoral vein into his inferior vena cava into his heart. Bullets are unpredictable. The other thing is bullets have consequences far beyond what may be readily apparent. And you'll see how this is going to apply to the larger discussion at hand. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about ballistics and give you a quick background in this. We call gunshot wounds and stabbings penetrating trauma versus blunt trauma, which is being hit by a car, right? or falling from 20 feet. But it's not really penetrating trauma because bullets don't cut, they crush. They crush through tissues and they cavitate. Meaning again, you have the bullet track and you have injury that extends far beyond that bullet track and affects t adjacent tissues. Not to belabor the point, but bullets crush individuals and they cavitate out to affect our community and society at large. And I don't mean to be overly dramatic about this, but this is a very important point that I wanted to illustrate. The objective of ballistics is carnage, right? Tissue destruction, that's the point. That's the point here, right? And we spent uh, design, engineering is all for this purpose and this purpose alone. So you can have jacketing. What's jacketing do? Moves through tissues very quickly. What's a hollow point do? It deforms immediately upon impact with tissues for maximal damage. We've got rip rounds in Louisville. Rip rounds are designed to enter the body and dissipate into six or seven different projectiles. So you can see it on this x-ray. You know, he has, this gentleman has one entrance wound and six or seven projectiles in his intra-abdominal cavity. That's what they're designed for. This is a normal liver over here, and this is a liver on the left after a penetrating injury. It's almost unrecognizable. The point of all this is massive tissue destruction occurs from these firearm injuries. Now, when I see this slide, we start to sweat, right? We're thinking, oh, God, high school physics, <laughs> you know. Uh, but if I had to summarize ballistics, it would look like this. It's very easy. It's a lot like real estate. There's a lot of people here that know a lot more about real estate than I do. But location, location, location is important. We're talking about anatomic location here. Where your shot is often much more important than what you're shot with. And that's something that we illustrate to our fellows and residents. You can see it play out very uh, very quickly here in our data from our trauma center over the last four or five years. You'll see 60% mortality, gunshot wound to the head, 20% to the chest, 10% to the abdomen, the 60-20-10 rule. You'd say, hey, I thought, you know, if you had a gunshot wound to the head, your mortality was much higher. These are just patients that arrived to the hospital alive and survived the first six hours, okay? So the mortality of a gunshot wound to the head is much higher than 60%, but if you make it through your initial assessment, uh, you still have a significant chance you're not going to make it through your injuries. How common is this tissue? Okay, for me, it's like an everyday issue, but I've got a skewed perspective one way. Most of us in our personal lives have, a, have the opposite end of the spectrum. We don't see this every day. So how common is this really in Louisville? And we've, we're staying away from politics, but I think this slide illustrates just like if we were going to talk about motor vehicle accidents, we'd have to talk about the number of cars in different areas, right? That is one potential contributor. This slide illustrates this perfectly, uh, a state to country firearm comparison, all right? So there are as many guns in Texas as there are Germany, California, China, okay? That just demonstrates this is fertile ground for these type of injuries. We have this discussion every time there's a mass shooting, right? You can't turn your TV on without seeing this. We cover this extensively. We had the standard Revere shooting here in Louisville, which my mentor and one of my heroes, Dr. Frank Miller, uh, wrote extensively about it 30 years ago. But that's not really what we're talking about here. We're not talking about mass shootings. We're talking about the everyday gun violence that happens right here in Louisville, Kentucky. And so that's what we're going to focus on. You see it in the news, right? You know, record years, 2017. This is Lexington. This is Louisville. You saw this headline. Louisville is the 11th on the list of deadliest cities. What's that mean? That means per capita, you're more likely to be killed in Louisville, Kentucky than you are Philadelphia, New York. This is a big problem here, okay? This is a big problem here. 
How big a problem is it? Well, we read a lot about the Zika virus. It got a lot of attention, as it should. This isn't to be flippant and say that these issues aren't important, but we heard a lot about the Zika virus. Here's the number of cases throughout the United States of the Zika virus, okay? Here's the number of firearm injuries, firearm fatalities. So it's a massive number by comparison, a massive number by comparison. And you can see it disproportionately affects the southern United States. University Hospital, what do we see? Well, this is our catchment area, and you can see Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois. We've got gunshot wounds from all these places. Regionalization of trauma care is something that's very important. You take your sickest patients and pool them into places that have the appropriate resources to deal with those injuries. So, you know, eventually all these are shuttled down here. But you can see we take care of gunshot wounds from Louisville, Tennessee, Ohio, Illinois. And what has that resulted in? Well, a stair-step increase in, gun, in patients admitted after a, a gunshot wound in our hospital. This is patients admitted. If you want the number of patients that are seen in University Hospital from these injuries, you can almost double these numbers, okay? That's a tremendous amount, and this is the last five years. This is home. This is where we live, this is where we love, this is where we're raising our children, right? This is home, but it's also a high-volume training center. That's something we probably don't want to be, right? Dr. Schwab in Philadelphia is a military man. He was trying to figure out, you know, where are we going to train our troops that are going to go out into combat and take care of explosive, take care of gunshot wounds on the combat field. And these are the places in our country where they decided are best suited to train these surgeons. And you don't really want to be on this list, right? But that's where we're at. So how did we get here? Now, this is a loaded, complicated question. Oh, you're like, oh, great, this, this yahoo's going to tell me how we got here. Well, I'm not going to tell you how we got here because it's complex. It's multiple issues, but I'll point out a couple of them, things that you might hear or, or, or that are readily discussed when you talk about, but you've got to back up because you're going to read a lot of statistics. You see a lot of statistics in, 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 in the media, and that's, that's good. But when you talk about this, you have to be very specific. Firearm injury, these are really three different groups, probably four if you add law enforcement in there, and they have entirely different characteristics, okay? You talk about an accidental shooting, right? You have a very low mortality. They usually shoot themselves in the leg, all right? You talk about intentional self-inflicted injuries. It's an entirely different issue. High mortality, usually gunshot wound to the head. Assault is sort of a smattering or a mix between those. But you can see, if you're going to talk about the issue, be specific about it. More than half the fatalities in 2016 from gunshot wounds were self-inflicted intentional injuries. That's an entirely different discussion than gun violence. Just as important, but a different discussion. And so we're focusing on violent injuries here. Um, so what are the contributors to violence? A again, a lot of stuff. There's individual characteristics, there's community level issues that are risk factors. So let's just pick out two, okay? Because I know I'm, I'm, I'm pushing my time here already probably. But okay, let's talk about mental illness and substance abuse. Apologize for the slide. Uh, this is something that we'd all in our discussion say, you know, why are people getting shot? Drugs, drugs, drugs. Well, is that part of the issue? Well, certainly would be. If you look at our retrospective data, you'll see that Mental illness is exceedingly low in the assault population, less so than the general population, right? If you say mental illness is about 5% of the general population, it's in 3, 3.5% three of the assault population. However, illicit drug use is highest in that group, all right? So, okay, there's something there, right? It's part of the, part of the, part of the, part of the characteristics that contribute to this. But is it the whole story? No, that's naive to think that's the whole story, okay? Let's talk about redlining. What is redlining? Many of you know more about redlining than I do, okay? But redlining is sort of systematically denying services based on racial or ethnic composition, okay? So that sounds like a terrible idea from the start, all right? This is something, these are policies that were instituted in the 1930s in the Great Depression by the Federal Housing Authority. They wanted to reinvigorate urban areas throughout our country. So they wanted direct resources back into our urban areas, okay? So that sounds good. All right, so where are they going to put the money? Well, you, when you get down to brass tacks, they created red, the redlining maps or residential security maps. And, and 200 cities across the United States have these maps, and they're fascinating if you have time to go in and look at them. Louisville has one, all right? And the, it, it's basically A is a good neighborhood, right? Um, mostly Caucasian. D is going to be composed of minority. This is not how they classified it in the 1930s. These policies extended all the way to the 70s and beyond, all right? So, 
okay, well, what does that, what does that, what does that have to do with what he's talking about? All right, well, so this, this is LNPD's data, which is fantastic. You go on their website, you can get a lot of it. And it's kind of cloudy, right? Now, if we're going to look at homicides, now you're starting to see something here, right? You look at resource distribution across our city, it looks something like that. Now you're starting to see a pattern here. Okay, this is the redlining map from 1934, okay? That's Louisville's redlining map, right? That's where resources, re these are gunshot wounds over a five-year period. They match up pretty darn well. Is this the explanation for gun violence in Kentucky? It's one of them, potentially, okay? So there's lots of different things. I just wanted to pull out an individual characteristic or risk factor and then a community-wide risk factor, and there's a lot more stuff in between there. All right, so you've just been shot. You walk out of here, you're shot. What happens, you know? Uh, well, you gotta get to the hospital first, right? How are you gonna get to the hospital? Well, most of you are gonna arrive by ambulance. Many people dropped off by their friends or brought in by helicopter coming from a lot of places. These are all our partners in getting patients to the hospital. Where are you gonna show up? You're gonna show up in our resuscitation room. This is a cold, lonely place uh, in our emergency room. Marshall doesn't like me describing it as cold and lonely. But uh, room nine, the resuscitation room. Here you'll be greeted by friendly healthcare providers across the board, all right? Surgeons, emergency medical, or our, our ER doctors, respiratory therapists, our nurses, okay, across the board. X-ray techs, you're evaluated here initially. Tubes be stuck in every orifice, you're stripped of all your clothes. This is a terrible place to be. Terrible place to be, okay? Um, does everyone go to the operating room? Not everybody goes to the operating room. If you're shot in the abdomen, there's about a 90% chance you're going to the operating room. If you're shot in the chest, there's about a 40% chance you're going to the operating room. In the extremity, much less than that. What do we do in the operating room? Well, this is what every human being looks like to a trauma surgeon, like, right? We're just walking. These are the types of incisions we, you know, we use to get to you, right? And it's very confusing for fellows and residents. They say, oh my God, is, uh, how do you get to this? Well, we're not bright people. So there's really only about 12 ways you have to, 12 incisions you have to know to take care of these injuries, all right? Your operative objective, save a life first. How do you do that? You stop bleeding, you control contamination, all right? Minimize morbidity. How do you do that? Well, vascular or blood flow in, blood flow out, right? That's an important thing. You want your bowels to all connect so you can eat, right? and then reestablishing bony continuity. That's what happens in the operating room. Say everything goes well, you leave the operating room. You go to our ICUs, you go to our floors. These are our nurse practitioners in their standard hospital attire. No, I'm just kidding. They're doing some service and outreach there. And you're admitted to these places and the clock starts ticking in my mind. The clock starts ticking. Not only to get them better, which is our primary responsibility, to get them better from their injuries, get them back to as good a functional status as they can, but also maybe, maybe, and this is what Mr. Marshall was talking about, maybe there are things we can do during this period of time that can impact them in other ways going forward. We have their attention, right? They're a captive audience, right? Many of them will go home, some will go to rehab facilities, some will go to jail, some will go to psychiatric facilities. Now that you can see the breakdown, more of those are gonna be the intentional self-inflicted injuries, but they go to different places. We got six days in a head wound, you got nine days in an abdominal wound to do something that will impact their life going forward beyond just getting them better. So now what, now what? Well, in many ways, violent injury prevention happens in this interface between the hospital and our community, right? We're all members of both, or well, we're all members of both of these things, right? But this is where violent injury prevention, or one potential place where violent injury prevention can happen. I think you have to understand this model because it's being implemented in, in Louisville in several different ways, but, and it's the Cure Violence Initiative. And how many have heard of the Cure Violence Initiative? Well, okay, very good, yeah, so more. So, um, Dr. Gary Slutkin, who is an infectious disease physician, I think it's worth talking about the origin story here. How did they develop this idea? He, he worked in Africa, he worked with cholera and he worked with tuberculosis, right? And their goal was to, it, to stop transmission of these diseases, stop these outbreaks. He got tired of that, came back to Chicago and said, oh, everything's great in Chicago. We don't have any, uh, we don't have TB, we don't have cholera and he started looking at these maps. And he started saying, wait, that, that look, cholera in Bangladesh looks a lot like homicide, there's a distribution. So that 
was the origin behind pure violence. It's had success throughout the world, okay? Is it the only model? No, but they've got good success throughout the model, or throughout the world. And this is one model we're implementing here. So we're not reinventing the wheel in Louisville, but we're continuing to evolve it and use it here in Louisville for what we need. So how do you do that? How do you stop epidemic outbreaks. Well, the World Health Organization has spent a lot of time investigating this, right? And there's three things. Interrupt transmission, prevent future spread, or, and change group norms. <laughs> okay, let's, okay, let's do that. Uh, you go interrupt transmission, you change group norm. These are big concepts. A lot of them are a little nebulous. But there's a program, there's a model for how we do this. What are the barriers? Obviously, it costs money, right? Obviously, once you buy in, you've got to continue to buy in. Sustainability is a major issue. It requires collaboration. It requires me to say, Alice Bridges, you and I don't work together, but now we do. What can you teach me and what can I teach you? <laughs> That's a hard thing for a surgeon to do, right? I like to stay in my operating room, and whenever Mr. Marshall calls me, I come do whatever. No. And, uh, so, so, but I'm happiest in the operating room, professionally. So, those are the barriers. So, but one thing you've got to back up and you've got to say, well, how are you going to know if these things are effective? This is something the University Hospital does very well. We have our trauma registry. We keep track of pretty granular data on everyone that comes in after an injury, all right? And that's kept. And it's de-identified and dumped into larger databases, okay? But something's lost with every time this data is transmitted, okay? What's my primary concern? My primary concern is Louisville, not what happens in Philadelphia. Right, I'm worried about what happens in Philadelphia, but my primary concern is what happens in Louisville. This is my home, this is my community. In conjunction with LNPD, we're building the most, what I believe will be the most comprehensive picture of what gun violence looks like uh, throughout the country. How does that happen? Well, it takes a lot of people, like a lot of people doing good work. And these are our trauma registrars, nine of them, that, that go through this data. And the potential for expanding beyond this is endless, right? But it starts with data. That's my point, okay? So now we're starting to collaborate. We're starting to work with people that are outside our walls, our four walls. Interrupting transmission. This is principle number one, right? How do you do that? Well, in Africa, they realize that if we send someone from the WHO down there, they're not going to be very effective, right? They don't trust somebody from the World Health Organization, right? They w so what you do is you educate, teach a, what is it, teach a person to fish, how does that go? Give a person a fish, they eat for a day, teach them to fish, they eat for the rest of their lives, right? So here, so the model is applied in this situation to what are called violence interrupters. And Dr. Eddie Wood's group and No More Red Dots has been instrumental in this. These folks are, have local credibility, they're there 24 hours a day, and they're trained in conflict resolution. Interrupt transmission. Retribution's a big deal. A lot of times after firearm injury, the first thing the family says is, are they okay? The second thing they say is, who did it? Right? That's not my, that's not, that's all, you know. But so retribution is a very big issue in gun violence. Preventing future spread, changing group norms, this is a bigger nebulous topic. This is a hard one to get at, but these are the things you do in order to do that. You have caseworkers who provide job training, assistance, housing resources, the things, those risk factors that you go back and look, how do you end up with a gunshot wound? These are some of the risk factors. That, I'm not trained to do that, but I can certainly, there's people in this room that are, and we can facilitate connections in order for that to happen. And then just making it part of the daily conversation. Stop the bleed campaign, which we can talk about if we need to. That's a way that we get out. And with all different groups, uh, governors, community leaders, and all that. Why is the trauma center the place where this should happen? Well, there is some trust between our patients and us, or at least there should be, right? And we owe it to them to honor that. But it's also a teachable moment. This is an impactful moment in their lives. Like I said, you have a captive audience. They're gonna, they may change their behavior in a way that they wouldn't outside of this particular instance, all right? Community partnerships and culturally competent case management, these are the things. So, Alice Bridges is here as well. This is the first iteration of the violence injury prevention approach. This is one piece of the larger cure violence model. This was Pivot to Peace, and maybe you've heard of this, and this was 2015. And this was a certain group of gunshot wounds just because resources were limited, picked out the people that might benefit the most. We had a community health worker, KJ Fields, uh, and then two dedicated social workers, and we started building partners, okay? We started building partners that can help 
facilitate those connections, can do something once they're connected. So this was in 2015. We learned a lot from this, right? We have learned a lot and now it continues to evolve. And this is 2.0 and I, I Rashad with the Office of Safety and Healthy Neighborhoods has been instrumental in this in bringing people that don't play in the same sandbox together, okay, to, 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 to build this. But Mr. Marshall, the University Hospital, we're continuing to put our resources into this because we absolutely see value. So you can see now it's been built. We got violence interrupters that start in the emergency room where a lot of the families and folks that have been immediately impacted by this are congregating, right, and then move out into the community. Violence interrupters obviously have the data. And the key, the key component is the community health workers who connect patient with resource, right? And so that's just a very brief or description. We got a lot of partners, a lot of them are here, probably a lot of folks that are involved in one of these groups or the other, and we're very thankful for that. And certainly, if you want to get involved, um, Annabelle Pike, stand up one more time, is here. And then Kim Denzik, our uh, trauma program manager. So I think we covered, I think it was a comprehensive review of gun violence in 14 minutes. So I'll turn it back over to Mr. Marshall. Now you know why I travel with him. <laughs> um, and so I just want to wrap up, and if, if there is time for discussion, we'll, we'll be happy to do that. Um, I asked Keith here today because it gives you detail around um, not only you know, the importance of what I started off with, which is I don't believe as a, as a healthcare organization you're an island anymore. It's too complex to, to view yourself that way. And how you connect with other um, organizations that are healthcare related or as you saw, non-healthcare related. Um, can impact the outcomes that we have for those who do walk through our, our door. It's a shift, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a different way of looking at um, how, we, um, how we treat patients and how we treat our community. So thank you very much. We've got uh, plenty of time. We'd like to invite any member that would like to uh, ask a couple of questions. Uh, please step forward, identify yourself. And I'd just like to say I thought that was a fascinating presentation. I'd almost like to see it again. There was so much to it. But uh, I think that um, the one thing that to me really stands out is the uh, 11th ranking or ranking 11th in the country in a, in a per capita basis on uh, such things. That's not a good place to be. So uh, let's go ahead. Tom, we'll start with you. Thank you. I'm Tom Bonert, and um, I don't know to whom to address the question, but, oh, okay. Uh, but uh, understanding the World Health Organization um, triad of how to address the problems of an epidemic, if I, if I were to be so bold as to add a fourth, it would be to evaluate the results. Have you uh, had the opportunity yet, is, is the program or programs uh, uh, on board enough that you've had evaluation opportunities? Yeah, so that's a great question. And that's, you know, in backing up, talking about the data, first you gotta have the right data, right? You gotta say, what outcome are we evaluating, right? A gunshot wound is the end of this paradigm, right? There's a lot of things that happen in between there. But yes, we are continuing to ongoing evaluation. Annabelle's here, we can talk about the exact numbers if you'd like, and we can share that with you afterwards. But yeah, certainly the major paradigm shift has been what we realized the first evaluation process, you say, well, what came out of Pivot 1.0? Well, the first thing was we weren't getting to enough people, right? We had one connector. Guess when gunshot wounds happen? Well, they don't happen between eight and three very often, right? They're happening in the middle of the night. Some of our patients, like I said, 40% will leave the emergency room in eight hours. I know that's hard. You think, well, you're shot, you're going to the hospital, you're gonna be there. No, many of them will leave if they've got an extremity wound that doesn't involve a major structure. And so we were catching those people. So the first evaluative piece was to discover that we're not touching as many, we're not getting to as many people as we need to. And that's why the expansion of the services. And then obviously the outcomes you wanna know and I wanna know, you're not gonna get until you've got a five year, you know, a, you'll have a year follow up, but yep, you, you want longitudinal, longitudinal outcomes, which are the most important. But thank you, that's a great question. Thank you very that much. That is the question, by the way. Not that your question isn't important. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, Jean West, thank you both for coming. Uh, that was an outstanding presentation, Dr. Miller. Uh, question, medical terrorism. I do know from my experience in a previous position that hospitals in Kentucky have been hit. Electrical systems have been held hostage. Payments have been requested. Payments have been made very quietly so that it doesn't get out that that happens. What are you doing as our level one, number one teaching hospital to prepare for that? That's a daily, uh, that's, that's uh, off, uh, you know, has nothing to do with uh, uh, cure violence, but it's a daily focus of um, our information technology piece. Um, we get uh, on uh, hourly, we get attacked. And so we can watch it. If I go over to IT, I can watch it today, and, and there will be attacks that happen to us on an hourly basis that, that we're catching. Um, and, you know, when, you know it's, it's not good that we're getting attacked, but it, when you do, you understand how to, how to fix it. And so as long as that keeps up, we get better and we get better and we get better. Do I, do I worry about that? Yes. Uh, we're, um, we are uh, fortunate that at this point we haven't had a, a breach of the kind that you're talking about. I know exactly what you're, what you're saying. Um, and, um, uh, you know, IT security is um, um, a leg of the stool when you talk about IT. It's just not does your monitor work and can I write, write an email. It's deeper than that. I'm Julie Schmidt with KET, and Dr. Miller, your presentation was wonderful, and your dedication is clear. Thank you okay. so much for it. Um, I'm just really curious what percentage of this is related to gangs, and is that escalating, or what's the subculture here in Louisville, or the region? Yeah, so that, that's an excellent question. I think, you know, we've got people here that can, can talk to that a little bit better. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, a piece of, it's a piece of the problem, right? And... Uh, uh, the terminology, you know, what is gang-related violence and what not, that's a very difficult distinction. You know, I'm a surgeon. Like, either you're bleeding or you're not, right? Like, these are binary <laughs> things. But with, 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 with violent, is this gang-related? Is it not? It's very difficult for us to determine that. Um, but there are models that have been built to try to assumptively go back and look and say, is this more likely than not to have been related to gang violence? And we're beginning to potentially apply some of those to ours. But, you know, I may not be the right, it's, it's a factor. It's a contributor. I don't want to say any more than that. I saw your four rules, and one of them was I always tell the truth, right? So that's about as granular as I can get while still telling the truth. So I'm going to end that there. We're all very aware of the problem of violence and the problem of drugs, but it's a distant awareness. We really are not directly involved in it. But the, there really has to be a, a real singular attack upon it. And I'm going to suggest to you that perhaps there is plenty of money in this town, private money, that would be very glad to help support saving our city from the gangs, from the violence, from, the, from drugs, and make it a wholesome environment that it used to be when some of us were younger. And I just wonder, that has not been tried, but it seems as if we just attacked it and attacked it and make it a constant awareness of us and the people who are not here in this, in our uh, bailiwick here, but that they could be drawn to it constantly, a year's worth, and then taper off the, the advertising. But public awareness counts. And there is no public awareness, even in this room. We can talk about it, but it doesn't touch us. The second thing is, could we get copy of your, of your slides? Absolutely. Okay, would, would, they, yeah, I mean, yeah, would yeah. they be available to the management of Rotary Club and we could solicit from there? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank you very can much. I, can I, I want to start one, and with one thing and then I'll let Keith take over. And, and it's just to, you know, this is a, you know, do, do everyone in this room um, is impacted by the things that Keith talked about. Uh, and you may not be associated with someone who's the victim of a violent act that required uh, some sort of health care, but everyone in this room, because we are part of a, a tax-paying society, pays for it. So um, it, it, it's, it's not confined to a single group. Uh, it's confined, it is for all of us to be aware of. Um, there is resources, you know, this morning, actually I started my day off with the discussion 
with um, Rashad and the folks at the mayor's office uh, with uh, additional grant money. You notice on key slides, there's the caseworkers and there was a picture and two empty spots. We're working on those two empty spots and they should be in place pretty soon. Um, and so there is, there is funding that starts to grow and the big conversation this morning was, um, we'll go to version 2.0 and when you get to version 2.0, we need to demonstrate um, you know, results that get us to version 3.0. And I challenged the group to, that was there this morning to say, okay, we're, at some point we're gonna get really good at this and we're gonna have a lot of experience and uh, we're, we are gonna be, a, we already are and we'll continue to be a model for the country. But we can't, as I, like I started, we can't leave it inside our four walls. Victims of violence hit other healthcare systems they hit urgent treatment centers, they hit uh, social service agencies, and if they don't have the benefit of the knowledge that we have, we're doing a disservice to everybody. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to take more question time, but three things, I, we'll start with the first thing. So the first thing would be, um, that, that's been, we've learned a lot through this, because there's a lot of resources out in our community, and you were talking about private funders, which you know I appreciate, but, and, and, and in addition to that, there's a lot of people here that want to help that just can't get to the people that need help, right? And so that was the, that was the easiest problem to solve. You know, we, these people are here. There's people that want to help. We can connect them. So the same, you know, extends to to, to other potential funders. The and so I, I appreciate that, and I think you're probably right. Um, so I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Renee Brown, uh, thank you for the presentation. I think I'm pretty much qualified to speak uh, about this topic. One, because I've been in combat four times for the service of our country. Thank you. Two. Uh, I passed through a church in West Louisville, and three, we were involved in an incident just Sunday, and I didn't hear that come up. And one of our challenges is the disconnection and the insensitivity that exists, and I think that if we can get beyond that, then we can do more. I say that because there are groups that act in pockets, and there are dots on a board Absolutely. but they're not netted together. Absolutely. So there may be things that you might be doing on this side that's not netted to where no I'm doubt. at or where the others at, because we're there day in and day out. I just wanted to make sure that No, I, I agree with that we, we, we understand that. And, and I'm, I want to just speak very, very frankly, no you know, because Pastor Vincent James, when he went through that, I mean, he was in tears. The, the community was in pandemonium. And there wasn't a lot of outreach to just check, to validate what you're doing in your study. And I say that so that we can do a partnership with you to validate that because there has to be more sensitivity. Because it's more than statistics, it's lives. Oh, and yeah, we yeah, really want to make sure that we, 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 grab, we grab a hold of that so that we can do that. And, and from a clergy community, you know, we deal in those sensitivities. And we can get to those connectors and the moms and the dads or the persons that are doing that. We have at my church today exists what we call real talk, where we get those either ex-offenders or current together to validate and find out what's going on and what we could do. But I really want to make sure that as we speak, we don't speak at the 40,000 foot level. We speak right at ground zero. So Thank you're you. invited to be to be to be one of our partners, absolutely. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> and and you're right on all the on all those points. Absolutely. Are we where we need to be? No. Uh, are we farther along, even just in our pocket, than we were five years ago? Yes. Yes. So thank you, and we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> yeah, we're just we're just about to one o'clock. Let's take these last two questions and let's try to make them quick so we can get everybody out by one. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Judy Handmaker. Outside the field of violence, do you see an increase in drug overdoses due to Oxycontin? And then my second question is, are you seeing a lot of that black tar heroin from Mexico that has invaded our community? Yeah, so I can answer the first question and say yes. The second question, so I'm a, and Ken, maybe Ken's gonna, but I'm a trauma surgeon, so the pure medical over, I'm a surgeon, so the pure overdoses, I don't necessarily see personally, okay? Because they, they don't 
need surgery. But uh, Ken can talk to that. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, on the first question about the opioids. Uh, we could have spent, we could have taken out uh, violence and put in opioids and probably had a, uh, you know, as, as a robust a discussion as we have here because we have uh, several programs that um, are, inter are similar interventions uh, for those who come to us as a result of opioid overdoses that connect, once again, outside of our four walls, that connect resources in, um, in the community and those who are inside institutions that are, you know, like jails and things that, that are there. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, following up on uh, what Renee uh, said, uh, it's my understanding that the, the killing on Sunday, the murder on Sunday, was from a decades-long grudge, essentially a revenge killing. So I think, I'm hopeful, that if your all's program had been in place maybe a decade ago, it might have disrupted that vengeance or that path to vengeance. So then that begs the question of the 40 so percent of uh, crimes that are violent related, gun crimes that are violent related, what percentage in your estimation are you know, vengeance related? Uh, that'll give you a sense of kind of what you're trying to get at. Our vengeance related, uh, you know, that, that's a tough number to come up with. I will say that we had a cure violence um, review in Louisville as part of potential implementation. And the expectation was that they thought and please, do forgive me for, uh, um, I don't mean these are just numbers in any way. I mean, and, and forgive me if I gave the impression that that's, that, that that's not the situation here. But in having this discussion, numbers are useful in some ways. And so Cure Violence Initiative, if you applied their model based on their prior statistics, they would expect to see about a 40% reduction in gun violence if implemented and sustained through a period of time. And that's from prior modeling applied to our situation here in Louisville. I just want to g give you, a, just, I'll finish with this little comment um, about a subsection of, of violence that we've uh, been attacking at UofL Hospital for a couple of decades now. And just to give you a, a point, to, to your point, that we're at the start, and yeah, I wish we would have had some mm -hmm. um, workers there that could have intervened on that day. Uh, 20 years ago, we started um, realizing that sexual assault was a severe problem in this community and began um, one of the, what, the first sexual assault program uh, with uh, other community agencies here in, in, in Louisville. That's 20 years old now. We're, we're now at 17 uh, sexual assault nurse examiners. We have partnerships with uh, Louisville uh, Metro Police and the Center for Women and Families. Um, have uh, clinics at the Center for Women and Families, and it's a program that has taken that long to grow. And now, finally, <laughs> uh, after a couple of decades, we're at a point where we say, um, where are the gaps that we've missed in this community? And there are, other, there are gaps in this community where sexual assault victims um, present that we need to make sure that they are trained and can recognize uh, issues, and we can intervene at that point. But it, it you know, it does take a long time, but you got to start. So, right. thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very nice thank you. Again, thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. We could probably go on for another hour, but we can't. So, uh, anyway, we uh, thanks to everybody for coming today. Thanks to our program uh, speakers, and we are adjourned.